Near the end of Wano, after the big war and everything that went down, I expected things to calm down for a bit, for the cast to have a little bit of breathing room, and everyone did. For like, two seconds. We got to see a bit of our cast reactions to bounties, we saw everyone celebrating at the end of Wano, we had the bathhouse scene. But I did not expect an immediate conflict in the form of a new admiral. I think it makes a lot of sense for the Briggs to come off and have immediate pressure, not purely within the context of the story, but also within the potential plot threads and themes that we're setting up following Wano. One of the things that Yamato really showed at the end of Wano was the cost of adventure. Throughout the entirety of Wano, Yamato had one claim. I want to be like Odin and travel the world. And for a large portion of Wano, that was their mission. And so what I found interesting is that by the end of Wano, Yamato's dream of going on an adventure was challenged by the threats surrounding Wano's freedom, which put Yamato and Momo in a position of actively defending their home. Throughout the story, one of the things that we've seen the Straw Hats do constantly is travel to an island and then liberate it from whatever injustice the people had been dealing with, and then leaving, hoping that the island has enough good people to hopefully restabilize itself into a functioning government. And that has mostly been the case with Vivi and Alabasta and Rebecca in Dressrosa. And so by Yamato wanting to go on this adventure, there is an inherent price of leaving your home in such a vulnerable position. I don't think the story had addressed this topic much until now, and I'm glad we're actually seeing some of it, because it's a pretty worrying thing that I remember thinking back in Fishman Island. You can assume that because of the Straw Hats' status and the name that they've made for themselves so far, that places they've allied with, such as Fishman Island, would be protected from threats, but there is always a sense of uncertainty, because there isn't someone within the crew to protect that post. Instead, it is left to the inhabitants of that island, and there's a trust that they'll be able to handle themselves well enough to deal with the situation at hand. At the end of Wano, Yamato and Momo made an important decision not to rely on the Straw Hats. It is an impactful moment for me that made me understand Momo's character, because there is a guilt that occurs when you understand that at some point, you must stand for yourself. That the crew has helped you get back up, and they would do it again, if asked. But there is a desperation in wanting to let the people who want to help you be free of that burden. And I think that's exactly what Momo is trying to say at the end of Wano, and what he's trying to push Yamato to understand. It's interesting to see the parallels across the story, especially when we compare it to a few other characters who technically should have been moving on, but feel forced to come back into action. Marco felt that way joining the raid of Wano and finally saying goodbye in chapter 1059. And Rayleigh having to come back again to stop Blackbeard from attacking Amazon Lily. Amazon Lily is currently in its most vulnerable state. The world government doesn't have a difficult time getting through the comm belt. Blackbeard sees it as prime hunting season. We know that he's going after specific people like Moria a while back and now Boa. As to why he wants Boa, or more likely the devil fruit, uh, I can't imagine. Blackbeard has done very aggressive plays with very cryptic intentions. Maybe he just wants Boa's devil fruit ability so he can validate whether he's pretty or not. It also doesn't really make sense to me why Kobe is being captured. Maybe it was Blackbeard's idea. Maybe it was Kobe's idea. Maybe he has a plan. Maybe Rayleigh just went, uh, eh, you can take the kid. <laughs> the third showcase of this is Vivi's kidnapping. It, again, emphasizes the cost of freedom as we see Luffy's reaction upon learning of the Nefetari situation. The crew can technically decide to turn back and check up on Alabasta, but this whole section is about relying on others to carry their own weight. That while you may want to help others, ultimately, you can't do everything, and you gotta hope that they can pull through. And if they can't, then you help or hope that you've built a strong enough foundation for someone to help them in your steed. I don't know if that means Sabo rescued Vivi, though it doesn't look like it. I don't know if one of the people who are allied with the Straw Hats rescued Vivi. Perhaps it was Shirahoshi or Rebecca or even Garp. Either way, we're seeing this running theme of characters having to stay back and protect their respective locations in a very turbulent environment. Which brings us to the start of Egghead. And I'm going to be real with you, I have no idea where we're going from here. Back at the Reverie, I was so confident. I'm like, okay, clearly we're setting up everything for the climax of the story to be at the Reverie. We have a lot of characters heading there. We've had a ton of buildup up to now. Emu is up there. All of the big baddies are up there. 
of course, there's still like a ton of things that we needed to wrap up, like Elbath, Luffy meeting Shang, Suisop meeting Yasop, all that stuff. But it was always my assumption that Marijua was going to be one of the set pieces where we were going to have a climactic fight. And now I'm not so sure about that anymore. If anything, now I assume that the Reverie was an introduction for Emu and we're setting up a lot of the plot points that are going to happen in future arcs in another location. So you know what? Let's just dive right into Egghead. The visual style of Egghead in its entirety is such a unique change of pace, especially coming from Wano. Everything feels like brighter and rounder and more lighthearted, and I guess that makes sense. It feels more in line with like Gear 5th Luffy, especially in the opening. The opening uses the stylized look that makes it difficult to tell whether these characters are 3D or 2D. They could be 2D, but the colors and shading and, and consistency made me feel like they could be 3D, but in a way that didn't bother me, which is something that did kind of bother me when we got into Egghead itself. Because Egghead, conceptually, is gorgeous. Visually, it's the sci-fi mixed wonderland, and it's something that, from what I've seen so far, the anime has had a lot more trouble portraying than in the manga. We're getting a lot less complex backgrounds, everything's a lot simpler in contrast to the manga, which feels like it's trying to show everything that it possibly can with this arc. However, there is always a trade-off, and I've noticed it as I've read the manga and then have come back to get footage for this review. And it is something that I've noticed so much that I went ahead and asked the community a bit ago how they felt about this. Essentially, it felt like as soon as we started Egghead, we have gotten so much information in every chapter that it almost feels overwhelming. Like, the pace has gone exponentially fast. I've always felt like the pace of One Piece has been increasing over time, but especially in Egghead, it feels like we ramped it up so much. And it is only when I stepped back and I watched the anime that I realized I kind of like this slower pace of the anime. Just because there is so much information that the anime gives me a little bit more time to breathe. I felt like I didn't really get the time to take in the entire atmosphere and the wonder of Egghead because the plot was still moving in contrast to the anime which has like a few moments to breathe where they're doing something dumb with the island itself or the characters. And I wonder if you guys have felt anything like this or if this is just a me thing. So as we're heading over into Egghead Island, we cut to Sabo for a moment who had been framed for killing Cobra, which I don't believe for a second. In fact, I don't believe any bit of that sentence. It's something that he himself denies. I think this is potentially a way to paint him in a darker light or to frame him as this bad guy and like as a way to conveniently take him out and have no one be against the idea. I also don't believe that Cobra is dead. Like, he could be, but why would you exactly? Like, what is the play here? And why is Vivi kidnapped? Hmm. Or maybe, or, or, um, hmm. Because if you were to kidnap Cobra, and frame him as dead, why would you kidnap Vivi and paint her as kidnapped and also not dead? Oh, okay, um, look, we don't have a lot of info as to what went down at the reverie, but presumably something bad happened, and in the midst of all of this, the world government got Cobra, painted him as dead, or killed him on the spot, and Vivi was taken by, like, an ally after witnessing this and is just framed as kidnapped. Perhaps she got taken by, like, Garp or the Revolutionary Army, but if that was the case, I think we would know. So maybe she got taken by an ally of the Straw Hats, like Shirahoshi or Rebecca or some third royal that we don't know, because we just don't know what happened, and it all happened so fast. Did they try to overturn some rule, and people were not okay with that, like the Fishman rights thing? Or were they killed for having information about the Poneglyphs? We know that Emu had a grudge against Vivi, but then why would she kill her dad? And not her! The questions at the Reverie just keep spiraling. Especially when it then gets to Sapo and the information that he found out at the Reverie. After the event of the Reverie, Sabo escapes and plans to tell the whole world about Emu. He tells the Revolutionary Army that he's safe, that he didn't kill Cobra, and before he gets the chance to spill the beans, which he took a little bit too long to get to, the transponder snail cuts off and the island of Lulucia ceases to exist. This is by far one of the most chilling and fascinating moments in One Piece. 
as the entire island gets beamed from above, leaving nothing but a hole in the ocean. I find the shot in the manga here absolutely gorgeous. And in the anime, it's haunting. We get the zoom of Emu's eyes, which look strikingly familiar to some other eyes that we've seen. And in the anime, we get this POV of the civilians of Lulucia as their entire kingdom leaves no trace behind. On my notes, I thought that, while it may be improbable, there was a chance that Saba wasn't in Lulucia at all. But in the anime, we get this shot of Sabo with a faint glow of the beam, showing that he actually was in Lulucia. I don't think he's dead, and I'll talk about that later, but at the end, Lulucia becomes this giant crater in the ocean, and it is such a memorable shot, and instantly reminded me of Ennis Lobby. Perhaps that is why there is a hole in Ennis Lobby. We learned so much with so little, and I love that. I am just now realizing that this arc is going to be full of mystery, huh? <laughs> in the middle of the sea, as the crew is heading towards a new island, we have a brief slice of life, joyful time with the crew, where Luffy, out of nowhere, tells us that he has some kind of dream. And I find this interesting specifically because we cut away from the dream itself. All we know is that in order for it to become a reality, he needs to become Pirate King and that everyone around him thinks that it is in line with who he is. What I like about this scene so much is that because not so many people know about this dream, it feels very much like something that Luffy has kept very close to his chest. We've gotten hints that Roger had a very similar dream and through Inherited Will has been carried by Luffy which makes it seem like something that isn't recent and something that both Roger and Luffy haven't been able to fully achieve. Which is why I don't think it's a physical object or an idea that's specific to themselves or an individual. As to the speculation of what I think that dream might be, <laughs> I don't know. I guess we should, uh, you know what? Sure, I'll take a crack at it. I'll take a few guesses. What if I'm just bad at it? <clears throat> the elimination of the world government. That seems too on the nose. Um, his own island. He wants everyone to be happy uh, and laugh. He wants an airplane. <laughs> a second straw hat. Luffy's dream is the freedom of choice and the freedom to live their life and not be hunted down, which I think would really connect well not only to his dream, maybe to Roger's dream, which then loops back to Yamato, who wants to explore but can't. And maybe that's why people like Ace and Sabo were also a fan of that idea, because they are also uh, in the same boat. Well, they're in different boats. Some of them are in boats. Let's move on. You know who I was not expecting to find an Egghead Island? Bonnie! Last time we saw Bonnie, things had drastically gone downhill. It appeared that Bonnie had lost her entire crew. She had been kidnapped by Blackbeard and then escaped and for a brief period was hiding in Mary Joe's. And frankly, I thought that's where she was going to stay. Why'd she leave Mary Joe's? Oh, that's right. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened uh, there in Mary Joe's. Whoops. <laughs> maybe that's why she escaped. Okay, maybe things went downhill in Mary Joe's and she had to book it. Understandable. And I had a lot of theories for what was going to happen in the story. But Bonnie, by far, has gotten the most amount of misses, I think. In her introduction, back in Sabaody Archipelago, I had this idea that Bonnie would be this character that Luffy would use as a mentor figure. Bonnie and Luffy were very similar characters, a bit stubborn, a bit cocky. I thought, oh, maybe Bonnie can teach Luffy a little bit of self-preservation. Kind of ironic now. So clearly, she didn't become the mentor figure. We got Rayleigh for that. Which, for the record, amazing choice. But I knew that eventually we would go through all of the supernovas, so at some point, we were bound to run into Bonnie again. But I did not expect her to be at probably one of her lowest points. Not only is she stripped away from everything that she once had back in Sabaody Archipelago, but also her involvement is completely in uncharted territory. So I think one of the questions that we can ask is what themes and motivations does Bonnie bring into Egghead? I think this arc is going to revolve around Devil Fruits since we got a whole bunch of new questions from Wano that Vegapunk of all people would be able to answer. 
and Bonnie's devil fruit might be a part of the picture, as immortality and longevity was one of the things that was really valued by the world government. So this whole arc feels like it's trying to be about discovery and new sciences. Um, hi, update, future me. You idiot! No, you got none of that right! <laughs> what you think we're gonna you think we're gonna learn about generic scientific progress some more? Shut up. Apparently Bonnie is Kuma's daughter. Um I know I didn't get that at all. I wanna know if anyone had predicted that, because I know back in Reverie we saw Bonnie looking at Kuma being kind of sad, being like, Oh, I'll I'll uh, see what they did to you or something like that. And I guess and I guess that could have been a hint that, like, oh, she's connected with Kuma in, like, a positive way. But back then, during the reverie, I interpreted that as, like, oh, Kuma must have pulled a, like, Sabaody Archipelago with Bonnie as well. And all of her crew got split up as well or something. I didn't even think that Bonnie would be at all related to Kuma. So this is all, this is all just new for me. I'm just along for the ride, frankly. <laughs> and it makes sense that with Kuma and Bonnie and Vegapunk that we'd get a lot of answers to what happened in Sabaody. Why exactly Kuma did what he did and why he let himself get turned into a robot and what exactly are Vegapunk's motivations in the first place. <laughs> and you know what? We can't really delay it much longer. Let's talk about Vegapunk. The person who this entire arc is built up for. Really, <laughs> really, really quick, really quick. Back when I reviewed, I think it was Sapaudi Archipelago, I got comments talking about this design of Vegapunk. And as soon as I saw this, my brain connected the dots. It too grew to the size of Vegapunk's brain. And so I want to take a small period of time to talk about the character design that is Vegapunk. When I drew this character design back in Sabaody, I was like, okay, Vegapunk is like a big brain scientist. Sure. So what if I just draw a big brain scientist? Har, <laughs> har, har, har. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be funny? Oda's entire gimmick was like, you know what would be a big brain character? An actual big brain character. Not only that, but he took it one step further, which I really love from the character design perspective. And he made it one of the most recognizable big-brained people, Einstein. And so Vegapunk's entire design is like a combination between Einstein and a big brain scientist. And also throw in this apple, which either is a reference to an apple a day keeps the doctor away, like that saying, or it's more like a nod to Isaac Newton with like the whole apple falling down on his head, which then, ironically, replaces the head of Vegapunk with an apple. <laughs> I love this character design, okay? It's so weird and cheesy, and yet it is so in line with One Piece. The one thing that out of anything else confuses me would probably be the big tongue, but if anything, I would throw that in with the fact that Vegapunk is a smart character, so maybe we're leaning into the archetype of like a really talkative character with like a big mouth or like a big tongue and they're always talking, Either way, I love this character design. The introduction of Vegapunk also introduced these other nine Vegapunk drones. Oh no, I don't remember if they're actually nine or not. Uh-oh. I'm just gonna say there's nine of them. Every variation of Vegapunk represents a different aspect of Vegapunk, each of which having strong character designs and their own unique personalities, making them feel really distinct despite all being part of one collective person, which I think is really cool. Hello, it's future me again. With that, I'm choosing to wrap up part one of Egghead right here. There's a lot of interesting things that I recorded and cut out of part one that will instead be in part two, just because it'll flow better with other segments. I hope it's fine that I'm popping around in the edit. So to you, it's not like a scene by scene or a chapter by chapter, but instead it's talking about this theme or everything about this topic. But if it didn't work out, that's fine. Just tell me. And then I'll go ahead and make adjustments for part two. It, it feels really weird to like review an arc that's still not finished. And so I'm kind of like placing down the train tracks as the train is going. And I'm having to shift things around every, every like chapter. That's it. Bye.